It's so good to see you tonight. I want to welcome those who are also watching on our Good Friday live stream tonight. Um, it's always a joy to be with you, uh, particularly on this special occasion. You know, it seems to be commonplace in our culture to rush through the calendar. You know, you get through the end of October, uh, the Thanksgiving decorations come out. Before you can even finish your dessert, Christmas is right in front of you. And of course, you know, Easter, we jump right to that, and then baseball and spring break and everything else. But you know what kind of gets always lost in the shuffle, even in the rush of the holiday calendar, is Good Friday. But it shouldn't be, because Good Friday is, without question, one of the most significant days in the history of the universe. When you think about Christianity and the significance of our faith, it's obviously much more than religion, man-made traditions and rituals. When you think about the heart of our faith, it comes down to what we assemble here together today to discuss and look upon. And so I wanna talk with you tonight about the seven statements from the cross of Christ. And what we mean by that is really the, the seven last words. And you know, everybody to some degree is gonna have a last meal, a last wish, a last breath. And in that last breath will be some last words. Now there's been some notable last statements and words and some not so famous. Uh, here's a few of them. P.T. Barnum, he said this uh, right before he died. They had a big show going on at Madison Square Garden and he asked, how are the receipts today at the garden? What was the gate like at the garden? How much money did we take in? And then he died. Old blue eyes, Frank Sinatra. Any Frank Sinatra fans out there, okay? Okay, take it easy, take it easy, take it easy. Don't be a little too crazy with that. He said, I'm losing it, and that was his last words. Leonardo da Vinci, he modestly said this, listen to his last words, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. The Mona Lisa wasn't good enough, what, you know? I mean, you know, but that inadequacy that he felt. And so, Winston Churchill, the, the great prime minister, said, I am bored with it all, and then he was done. And, you know, there's been other words that have been said, and some of them more endearing, obviously, uh, between husband and wife or children or people of that type of elk and relationship status. Uh, but there were seven incredible and significant statements that were made at the cross. And now some people call these the last words of Christ, I think that's the wrong title because those weren't his last words because he defeated death on the third day. So those weren't his last words. So it's wrong. We're going to talk about the seven last words of Christ. Well, they weren't his last words, but they were seven significant statements that were made at the cross. And you're going to want to know about them because these seven statements are so important. Now, as you know, the number seven is significant, not because that's the number you play uh, at Lotto or at the table or something like that, or your scratch off. The number seven is prominent throughout the scriptures. Seven days of creation. There's a completion that's attached to it. You might recall, and there's a lot of these that I could go through, but you might recall Naaman in 2 Kings 5.10. He had to go bathe seven times when he had the leprosy. Joshua was told in conjunction with the wall of Jericho, he was given a mandate to do something seven times times. As you go through the scriptures, uh, we see that there were other significant attachments to seven. I wrote a few of them down. You have in John's gospel, seven things that the Lord hates. We see that in the book of Proverbs. Uh, the number seven is also attached to comfort. Uh, there's seven I am's of Jesus in John's gospel. Um, there are seven parables, uh, seven woe parables that were given. And then you get to the book of Revelation, and there are, and if you went through my Revelation study last year, you might recall this, but the, the number seven is mentioned 50 times in the book of Revelation alone. Um, obviously attached to judgment, you have the seven churches. and It's just truly amazing. When you do a holistic study of the scripture, the number seven is mentioned over 700 times. It's significant. The number seven is, is a biblical mandate. It's a term of completion. And of course... Here, it is a term of victory, the seven statements 
of Jesus. And so it's my privilege to give them to you in chronological order this evening. And my hope is, is that these seven statements, they should not come as a surprise, but they should inspire each and every one of us and have a deeper appreciation for our faith. And so I've listed them for you. Um, there's nothing to write down. There, this is, these notes I provided are for you to take home. Um, and we have some of these points on the screen as well so you could follow along. But I want to tell you about these seven statements of Christ in order. And we begin by looking at the 23rd chapter of Luke's gospel. Now, as you harmonize all four accounts, which all four accounts give us the details of the crucifixion of Christ, which we will fill in as we go through all seven of these statements. When we come to Luke's gospel, we borrow from Matthew's gospel. As I've mentioned before, Matthew is, he is a, a former tax collector. He was a Jew who was collecting taxes for Rome. He was so fed up with the religious system that he went to go work for the enemy. And so he collects taxes for Rome. He comes to Christ, leaves the tax collecting profession, and he becomes this follower of Christ. God taps him to write the book of Matthew, and he gives us a lot of inside track details concerning the events of Christ that are in conjunction with the Roman Empire because he had connections there. I think we could see uh, the practicality in that. And so he tells us and makes very clear a lot of the insults and Jesus was being spat upon in addition to the horrible beatings which we will chronicle that he took uh, that, that he endured through this whole process. Um, while all this is going on, Jesus is now, uh, as what was beautifully shared during our worship uh, this evening and what was read, Jesus at this point has gone to the cross. And here's the first statement from the cross, okay? It starts off here in Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The very first statement from the cross, take note, is a statement of forgiveness. Contrary to those who try to interpret the Bible and poke holes in the story of the Scripture, oh, this is made up, oh, it's a bunch of rules, oh, you have to be perfect, and you get it every time this time of the year, the History Channel has specials, and you have some guy, and no offense, with a British accent, who has a, you know some type of de you know some type of degree in language arts, who's now going to tell me about the integrity of the scripture. Now, as much as I love you and you love me, that's like you saying, "I got it. I need a root canal, Ray. Can I come to your garage? You have to service. I love you. I know you. I trust you could do it. Listen, no matter how much we care about each other, I'm not doing your root canal, and you don't want me doing your root canal." And I don't need a language arts professor with an accent that's probably made up anyway to tell me about the validity of the scriptures. It's a statement of forgiveness. He's forgiven you and I. Now, do we need forgiveness? Let me ask a question. Do you need forgiveness? Yes. Uh, sure you do. Now, let me just do an experiment here, okay? How many of you ever been on a, remember way back when, or maybe if you're in school right now, how many of you have been on a class trip before? Anybody been on a class trip? You like your class trips. You get out of school for the day. Yeah, they, they, you know, they overpriced them, we know that, but you go on a class trip, it's great. How many of you have been on a vacation trip before? That's great. You know, somebody asked me, hey, are you going anywhere um, for, for the vacation? You know, the kids are off. I heard you're going on a cruise. I said, yeah, I'm going on a cruise. We're leaving from Port St. George and arriving at Port Whitehall, okay? <laughs> That's about it. That's about it, okay? Stale pretzels, the smell of unclean bathrooms, it's going to be tremendous. <laughs> So vacation trip. You may have been on a vacation trip before. Maybe you've been on a mission trip before. How many have ever been on a guilt trip before? Oh boy, that's everybody, right? You need forgiveness. You need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The very first statement, don't miss it, is not a statement on how to wear your hair, how to dress, how to be entertained, how to have uh, the hairs on your arms stand up when you come to church, and how, how high is the temperature, how low is the temperature, how comfortable is the seating, what do they have for me? And no, no, the first statement from the cross is a statement of forgiveness because there's not a human on the planet that doesn't need it. That's why. You need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. 
and Jesus came to provide it, the very first statement. In the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, this is what we're told. Lord, if you kept an account of iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. A statement of forgiveness has been made to you and to me, and it is an undisputed fact that can never be wiped away. No wonder the devil and the forces of hell were trying to fight Christ going to the cross so much. See, there can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, and Christ went to the cross for me and for you. A statement of forgiveness. Now, the next statement happens and comes from the same gospel account, Luke 23, 43. You might recall, let me set it up for you, uh, the a very famous story in the Bible, the two thieves on the cross. And uh, we know that one rejected and, and one received. And the one that received, listen to what Jesus said to him. Truly I tell you, today, and if you know it, you could say the rest of it with me. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, that becomes more of an important statement, I think, the older you get, right? You know, when you're younger, you feel invincible. I remember when I was young, I would ride my bike through intersections. If my mother knew, well, she's watching now, she's really going to be upset with me. She would have, she, oh boy, I would have been more punished than I already was when I was younger. You know, when you're, when you're young, you feel invincible. But, you know, when you get older, things start breaking down and, you know, you start, okay, now I guess, well, according to statistics, I'm halfway through, okay, or I'm three quarters. And you start thinking about the end. And I told you before my theology on that, if you kept, no, no matter how much, you know, we try to do to ourselves, if you kept getting better looking, you never want to leave this place. And so God is slowly but surely detaching you and I for eternity. And eternity is not a maybe. It's not a, well, you know what, thief, I know you believe, but you got to do these things. There's no record of him getting off the cross, getting baptized putting an offering in, going to church. Now, all those things are important. You should get baptized. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you should be. That's like somebody getting married uh, and somebody proposes, uh, you know, a guy proposes to his girl and says, hey, I love you, here's the ring, but don't tell anybody. What? You know, you come to faith in Christ, you get baptized, you're, you're saying to, to everybody, I believe in Christ. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, even Jesus did, it's a beautiful thing. Now, you don't need to do those things though to go to heaven. Because somebody might be thinking, how do I go to heaven? How do I know I'm gonna go to heaven? Well, this is how. When he said, you're going to be with me in paradise, the second statement from the cross is this. It's a statement of promise. Can you say that with me? A statement of promise. It's not a statement of works. Could you imagine if heaven was based on works, how lousy it would be once you got to heaven? Because people brag now. Imagine that. Yeah, I'm here because I gave a million dollars to the Red Cross, or I did this, and I was with Habitat Humanity. You should have seen me. I was amazing, and that's why I'm here. Oh, who would want to be there? So, I mean, people brag now. Imagine for all of eternity, you hear somebody, you know, bragging about why they're here. But no, salvation is not by works, at least one should boast, but it's by the grace of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. See, Christ went to the cross for me and for you. And when he said to the thief on the cross, you're going to be with me in paradise, it wasn't hyperbole. He wasn't trying to wax poetically. It was a guaranteed promise that you could take to the bank. Because a lot of times we go, man, how do I know I could be saved? How do I? Well, here's how you know, because Jesus said you could be saved. That's how you know. It's by faith. It's his promise. It's what he has said to you. He has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. The statement from the cross is that you can believe because Christ said it. And all of his promises, all of God's promises, we're told, find their yes and their amen in Jesus. It's a statement of promise. The second statement from the cross. First, forgiveness. Second, a statement of promise. 
Salvation is not built on man-made merits. It is based on the sacrificial death of Christ and upheld by his word, and you could trust it. And tonight, if you're sitting here tonight, listen, lots of reasons why people watch services and come to church. We're all sinners. We all need Christ. Nobody's better than anybody. Everybody needs this promise. And if the thief could get this promise, then this scoundrel could get it, and so could you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, one day we're all gonna, you're gonna stand before God, and you need to have a trust, again, not in your religious performance, but in the righteous promise of Jesus Christ. That's what you need. The clock is ticking. You don't know how long you have. We don't know how long we have. The world isn't getting nicer. It's getting worse by the moment. It's getting worse each and every day. We are getting closer and closer. This much is true, though. God's promises stand no matter what. And you want to trust in the promise of eternal life. The Bible makes very clear that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God's son, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, this is the promise, you will be saved. You need to know this. It's based on a promise, not a hunch. It's based on what Christ has said. And if he said it, you can lock it up. You can guarantee it. You can hang your heart on it tonight. No matter what, you don't got to live in fear because it's built on his promise. You don't base salvation on your feelings because you, you might feel lousy one day. You may wake up one day and go, man, I don't feel like God loves me. That's not God's fault. That may be the White Castle you shouldn't have been eating, okay? <laughs> don't base it on feelings. Base it on faith. And base your faith on the promises that God has made. You know, he has a 1,000% track record in keeping his promises. The statement of promise. Let's go on to our third statement here. And you might want to take note of this one, okay? One that we could all practically apply in how we treat people too. This is called the statement of awareness. Can you see that with me? The statement of awareness. Now, as we get here to John chapter 19, you find your place there, 26, as we transition to his account. Remember, John's an eyewitness. All the other disciples fled from the scene. John is at the foot of the cross with the accompanying women who supported the ministry of Christ, and of course, the beloved mother of Jesus, Mary. And at this point, Christ is, has been beaten to a bloody pulp, a significant blood loss. As you know, crucifixion, um, we don't need to go into the gory details of it, um, but it was, it was nothing like we imagine today. Um, it, it truly was. You know, people look at the cross sometimes as like a rabbit's foot, like a good luck charm. It was a sign of execution. And even before you got to the cross, uh, there was a significant hardship that one endured. As we know, Jesus, as I've told you many times before, was subjected to six unjust trials, three Romans, three Jewish trials. Most of them took place at night to violate, uh, which violated their own laws. They were shams of a trial. They were doing that so they could uh, hoodwink him into the system to get him prosecuted in, the, in an illegal way. Well, once they did that, uh, Pilate didn't want to crucify him. Pilate knew he was innocent. And that is very clear even by what Pilate put over the head of Jesus that here lie, here's the king of the Jews. That was Pilate's track to the world, by the way. Remember the Jews wanted him to change it? And he says, no, what I've written, I've written. And that was his track to the world. Now, he knew he was innocent um, and he didn't want to crucify him. And so he thought he could suffice them and Part of uh, one of the, the ways that the Romans um, dealt with, uh, with prisoners was they tortured them and they were whipped 39 times. They couldn't be whipped more than 40 because that would break the Jewish law uh, that they had, also attached to Deuteronomy 25, 3 for a criminal. And so uh, you could be whipped up to 39 times. And if they whipped them 39 times, and the type of whip they used was a cat of nine tail that had uh, in it uh, nine different way, nine different, like we would say like metal or some type of glass uh, as we would understand it. In that whip, when it hit the, the victim's back, it was striking them nine times. Now, if he got whipped 39 times and it 
it's the possibility of being hit nine different times, each of those 39 times, Christ suffered 351 wounds when he was enduring the beating. And so now he goes to the cross, the torture of crucifixion we know. The pain was excruciating, but it was the suffocating that was the main problem as you tried to uh, you know, gather yourself when you would and push up. You were putting heavy pressure upon your lungs. And so this was a torturous death. There was no doubt about it. And while all this is going on, Christ is aware of guess who? His mother. And you know, for those that don't call their mother, call your mother, okay, after hearing this, okay? But listen to this here, Nine, John 19, 26 to 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by. Now, who's that? That's John. John's so humble, he doesn't even name himself here, okay? Disciple whom he loved, because you know, Jesus loved John, and John, John was, I think, the youngest um, but John would outlive everybody, as we know. John's at the foot of the cross here. Everybody else ran for the hills is hiding. He said to his mother, woman, and, and don't take that as being disrespectful. Um, it, it's, it, it's translated woman in our language, but, but it's a term of endearment in their language, okay? So, and, and by the way, don't, don't say that to your wife or your mother later and say it's a term of endearment in Greek, okay? Don't do that. Don't do that, okay? You'll get hit with lightning. Woman, <laughs> behold your son. Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, beloved, behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now, at this point, Mary is a widow. Uh, Joseph has passed on. And church history tells us she lived at approximately another 12 years after the resurrection. And John took care of her. Now, Jesus had half brothers and half sisters, but they weren't at the foot of the cross. And, he feel, and it was customary for the oldest if he was to die before his younger siblings to make sure his mother would be taken care of. That was their culture. And in the agony of what I just told you about, he still had the presence of mind to be aware of the grief of his mother. And you know, I think about it in our culture today, you know, we treat people bad because we haven't eaten yet. We had a bad day. Something didn't go our way. And we think that's a license to act like any way we want. If Jesus could maintain the biblical order of respect when he was going through the agony of crucifixion, what does that say for you and I and how we should be, practically speaking? I like to be practical, right? This is stuff we need to apply. This isn't religion class and we get a, we get a check because we came. A check mark, not a check. Nobody's getting a check because they came, okay? But, <laughs> but a check mark, okay, because you went to church. No. We want to apply it into our life. And we want to look to the Lord and look at this statement. It's a statement of awareness. Now, uh, let's apply it to our relationship with him. God, the son of God. And if this is you tonight, you need to hear this. I, this listen, odds are somebody needs to hear this, this specific point. God is fully aware of you and your adversity. There is not a detail of your life that catches him by surprise, including your pain. The Bible says he has kept track of every tear you have shed. And I would imagine there's a purpose for that. And maybe one day when we're in heaven, maybe that, that bottle will be broken. I don't know. Maybe those tears will be turned to tears. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work out. But this much I know, a holy God is fully aware of you and every fear you have, every doubt, every trouble you have. The statement from the cross is a statement of awareness from Jesus. He cares about you and I. He wants to be attentive to you and I. You know, attention is one of the best things we can give to one another. You know, I remember, I, I can't remember exactly how many years ago it was, but I remember one time uh, Ben wanted my attention I, and I had a book that I was reading and I said, yes, Ben, and he, he's asking me a question and, and, you know, yes, Ben, I can hear you. Uh, yes, Ben, and then he, he pulled the book down and he says, daddy, look at me, okay? Why? Because attention. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's looking at his mother. Instead of his eyes being on his pain, his eyes are on his mother. He's aware. It's a statement of awareness. It's a statement of attention. It, Jesus is not asleep at the wheel. 
I know sometimes, like, you, like me, maybe you've prayed, you go, God, why haven't you answered this? And why did this one die? And why did this have to happen? And I have questions just like you do. And it's not going to make sense here for a lot of those things. It'll make sense on the other side, don't you worry. But this much is true, is that God is fully aware of you and your adversity. And here it is right at the cross, a statement from the cross here is a statement of awareness. He knows you and I. He knows what we have need of before we even ask it. He knows our thoughts are far off. He knows your pain right now that you might be going through. It's a statement of awareness. The fourth statement, the statement of substitution. Could you hear that with me? Statement of substitution. In Matthew's gospel, now we cross over to Matthew, we get, you know, Christ was on the cross a total of six hours. At about the third into the, the second set of six, the second set of three, the three to six maybe um, hours, maybe at the, as we would say at 12 o'clock, okay? So from nine to 12, and now from 12 to three. In that three-hour window, the wrath of God now was going to be poured out on Christ. Because sometimes people go, well, why did Jesus, why does this have to happen anyway? Well, if he's God, which he is, and, and he's a just God, and there has been sins that have been committed by all of us. We're all sinners, by the way. It's passed on in our, in our bloodstream. There has to be some type of payment, some type of reckoning, so forgiveness could be possible, or God, or all this is fake then. Well, then, then, then this doesn't make sense. There has to be a payment, because there's a bill. There's a bill. There's got to be a payment. And so in order for this to happen, though, um, because there's a bill, we're now a hostage to the enemy. And in order for us to be released, as it were, there had to be a substitution for me and for you. There had to be. And that's what Christ is. He's not just some good moral guy with a beard. He's not just somebody with some English accent when they make these movies and they make them look like a hippie. Loose flash, this happened in the Middle East, okay? He, it's a statement of substitution because he took my place and he took your place. Look what it says in Matthew 27, 46. At, a, at about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out. So this is after three hours of God's wrath being poured upon him. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthia, which means this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, why would Jesus be saying that? After all, isn't Jesus and the Father one, the Spirit? Yes. But God cannot look upon sin, right? And so for the first time ever in the history of all that we know, for that matter, in the history of all history that dates back before you and I ever were, before this world ever started spinning, God the Father and God the Son were separated. And they were separated so you and I would never have to be separated from God. Jesus endured, you know, the, Jesus was suffering here in this moment of faith worse than death. He was being separated from God the Father. And that's why when you and I die one day, whenever it might be, we don't have to fear being separated from God because Christ already endured that for you and I. He was the substitute, as it were, for me and for you. It's a statement of substitution by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you flip over here, if you're following along in your notes, this fifth statement, really, it's kind of, it, there's seven, but you know, think of five as being in between. It kind of makes sense because it, it kind of holds them together. The fifth statement is the statement of Scripture. Can you say that with me? The statement of Scripture. You know, Jesus fulfilled over to say, and I'll just be conservative with, with this, um, this number. He, he fulfilled approximately 304 prophecies which is extremely significant. And you could even go higher than that if you want with some of the other Psalms um, as well. But just say, let's just conservatively say he fulfilled 300, just say he fulfilled 300 prophecies. Obviously, the likelihood of somebody doing that is a number that we can't calculate even if we had our iPhone calculator out, which you shouldn't have your iPhone calculator out anyway. He fulfilled every one of them. And here was another one he filled. And this is a significant prophecy because this is right before he died. This is on the cross. Look, it says in John 19, 28, after this, so Jesus, so after this, after he committed 
Mary, his mother, into John's care. And after he experienced the separation from God the Father, after this is a very heavy statement. After this also speaks of a darkness that came over the cross. There are world historians that talk about what we refer to, we might say a blackout or an eclipse that happened right at that juncture from 12 to 3. A darkness came over the earth, came over the mountain. Why? Where Christ was. Because God was judging the sin of the world, my sin and your sin, every stupid, sinful thing we've ever did on Jesus at that moment. After this, that's what John is saying, because John was there. After this, knowing that all was now finished, he said, notice this, to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. And in that simple moment, and then after uh, receiving something a little bit later on, he fulfilled a significant prophecy. It might seem insignificant to others, but it's significant if you're going to say he's the Messiah, is Psalm 69, verse 21. And also Psalm 22, if you want to throw that in there as well. He fulfilled those prophecies. So this is a statement of Scripture that you could trust the promises of God. You could trust the, the hope that comes from the Scriptures because it's a statement here of the Scripture that, that we believe, we have faith because of the Scripture. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. The verse we love to say, what? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. It's the Holy Scriptures. And the scriptures preserve the story. And having been, I've had the privilege of studying every major world religion, there is not a religious document on the face of the earth that could stand toe to toe with the veracity of the historical natures of the scriptures. Can't happen. Um, and then you go into, you go into archaeological discoveries that have been found. We have, that has been already discovered, Fragments of 1 Corinthians 15, which is known as the, Revo the, the, what? the resurrection chapter. And that was written 12 years after the, cru the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. For those of you historians, that is extremely significant that you would have a document that close. And then, of course, we know in that document it says that he was seen by over 500 witnesses. We know that there are extra biblical resources because you might be sitting here today going, oh, of course he's going to say that. He's, the, he's kind of the guy, you know, he's the preacher. He's got to say this stuff. Well, don't take my word for it. Go look at what Josephus said. Go look what Tacitus said. Go study the Talmud and say how, see how Christ fulfilled some of the very things that were there about the Messiah. You do your homework. You, before you say none of this is real and I don't need it, you do need it. And the scripture bears witness and there, again, is not a religion on the planet that can speak to the need you have in your heart like this. And there is not a document that has stood the test of time like the Scriptures. It's a statement of Scripture from the cross, I thirst. The sixth statement, a statement of assurance. Can you say that with me? A statement of assurance. You know, there's a lot of good people. And obviously, there are good people that are better than others. We know that. Just by just turning the news, we know that, okay? But if your good gives you 50%, you're still 50% short to get to heaven. And that 50, you can't make up, no matter how much good you do. Only Christ could make it up. And you could be assured. See, I don't want anybody leaving the night without knowing without a shadow of a doubt that you know Christ is Savior. And you might say, how do we know that? Well, because Jesus did it. Look what it says in John 19.30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, so when he said, I thirst, he had to loosen up his jaw. He was completely dehydrated at this juncture in the crucifixion. He said, it is finished. I guarantee you these words not only reverberated on the earth, they reverberated in hell. It was a death blow to hell. It is finished. Then he bowed his head to give up his spirit. It is finished. Now, we know what that word means in the Greek language. It's to tell a sty. And people would use it for two different reasons. Maybe when they were cooking, they would say, okay, you know, maybe you're making something, you know, you're making sauce. And okay, to tell a sty, come and eat. It's done. It's finished. Come and eat. To tell a sty. To tell a sty. Come on, to tell a sty already. Get in here. Get in here. Turn it off. Come in here. To tell a sty. 
that was one way is it's finished. It's done. It's complete. The time has come. And then the other way, as you know, the more that this is probably the more common way that you may know of, is that it was used in terms of a currency talk. Like when somebody performed a job for you and you paid them in full, they would stamp on the receipt, the equivalent of, and whatever way they were able to do that, to tell us die. Paid in full. And so the sixth statement that comes from the cross is assurance that has been paid for in full. It, Jesus didn't say, you're finished. He wasn't saying, I'm finished. It is finished, which means I have satisfied the wrath of God once and for all. I am the atonement. You don't need to do this and do that. I've done it already. You just simply need to put your faith in me and what I've said, that I am the son of God. I've died for your sins and I've risen from the dead. That is what we need to put our faith in tonight. Put your heart in. Is that what I got to do? That's what I got to do. Now, it's not just words. It's believing in your heart this, that God, I know I'm a sinner. I think everybody would agree with that. God, I know I'm a sinner. One out of one people die. I got to have this. I got to know what I'm doing here. And it's not that the prayer is magic. It's not that it's mystical. It's merciful. It is finished. He paid for it in full for me and for you. And you could know tonight that heaven is a guarantee because you have a, it was a statement of assurance. Jesus wanted to assure everybody for all of history, for me and for you tonight. Certainly somebody who's watching tonight that needs to know this, somebody that's watching on the live stream, somebody that'll watch it later tonight, whenever, uh, maybe five years from now, who knows? Somebody that'll watch it, you know, 10 years from now, who knows? You could be assured without a shadow of a doubt because Christ said it is finished. He died for your sins. He took Barabbas' place. Remember, Barabbas was supposed to be crucified. Christ took his place, but he also took my place and he took your place. The substitute said it is finished. The substitute said you could have full assurance. And because he said it is finished, you know what else that means? You could never lose it. You could never lose it. He didn't say, well, it's kind of finished. I hope you don't mess it up. He said, it is finished. That's it. Finito. Done. Lock it up. It's done. It's finished. Statement of assurance. Now, with all these statements being true, remember I said these are, these are in chronological order, by the way. And again, these aren't the seven, let's study the seven last statements of Jesus. And I told you, no, we don't call it that because it's not his last statements because the story is not done with the cross. The, 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 uh, the, the report doesn't end with a funeral. And the report is not going to end with our obituary either. Because the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives inside of me and you. Amen. These seven statements, not last words, these seven statements from the cross should give you and I pause on this Holy Week to say, you know what? I don't need, I may not have it all figured out. And by the way, nobody does. So just so you know that. I don't care. I don't care what they might tell you, what front they try to put on. Nobody does. Everybody needs these statements. And this last one, oh, how beautiful is this? Jesus is going to give a statement of fearlessness. Can you say that with me? Statement of fearlessness. It's a statement of fearlessness that no matter what it is that you see today, everybody, everybody fears things. And there's all these different phobias, right? We even fear things in our sleep. You know how many times I've had a nightmare before church that I'm up here and I totally forgot what I had to tell you. Okay. <laughs> and I wake up. Oh, that's not true. <sighs> is it true? Wait a minute. Is it Sunday night now and not Saturday night? You know, and then you get a little crazy. We even fear things in our sleep. And I guess that's always going to play on our minds. But let me tell you something you never have to fear. Death. You never have to fear death. 
Because Jesus did it. Look what it says in Luke 23, 43. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, wait a minute now. If you don't mind, let me just go back to Matthew's account. Remember, it was my God, my God. Now we're back to Father. Why? Because the payment's been made. The relationship's been restored. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, his last prior to the resurrection. See, sometimes, and let me just say this, people want to address the problems of their life with different measures. I need this, I need that. If I can only have more of this, if I can only have that. And no wonder why we are the generation of anxiousness and trepidation. With all the modern technology, with all the things we have at our fingertips, we're still shaking in our boots. Sometimes I wonder what my grandparents would say, you know, at these times that we're living in. Oh boy, what would they say? And they had to get by with so much less. Could it be that all the fanciness of the world, all the ways of society, maybe they're not always God's ways, right? And could it be that the things that we are holding on to are really false senses of security? Because in the summation of life, when somebody's at their deathbed, they're not going to go, hey, pastor, could you bring me my trophies? Could you open up my Instagram feed? I got to look at all my, my posts. Read me all my likes. My comments. Oh, tell me about it. Oh, oh. Well, that's how people live. But nobody says that. I haven't anybody said that yet. Nobody says, hey, could you, could, you dry, could you push the bed to the window so I can look at my car one more time? And you look at it. Nobody says things like that. But these are the things we think they become, and other things, and you could fill in the blanks, okay? And this isn't a judgment statement because we all do it to some degree. We have these false senses of security. But all we need is Jesus. All we need is Jesus. And I'm reminded of a story I heard of sweet little Mother Teresa when a delegation of nuns went to Calcutta, India to learn about what was going on there. They asked uh, Mother Teresa, and, and, and here's the story. They said, how is it that you are doing so well in your ministry to the sick when so many other ministries are dying and you're in this very difficult part of the world. And then Mother Teresa replied, I give them Jesus. And now the impatient woman, uh, the other, uh, another nun, by the way, impatiently said, no, 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 no. I know that, but could you please be more specific? Do your sisters object to wearing, you know, the hat, the habits, whatever you call it? Uh, what about the rules that you have to enforce? And, how do they feel about that? And, and then Mother Teresa said, only one thing matters. I give them Jesus. Yeah, yes, 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 persisted the, the other nun. Um, but could you tell me there's got to be more than that? And the little Mother Teresa walked up now to her right in her face, stood on her tippy toes, and said in the most sternest voice, I give them Jesus. There's nothing more. What was she saying? Religion and rules don't save or transform anyone. Jesus does. Amen. You could be fearless because of Christ. Not all the things of this world, and they're nice things. Enjoy them for what they are. They're a means to an end, but they are not a bridge to eternity. And they're certainly not a comfort to the soul. Only Christ is. And that's the legacy we need to leave behind, a legacy of fearlessness, just like Christ. He did not fear death because he knew he was coming to accomplish the will of the Father. He knew about the plan of eternity, and we need to know it as well. William Randolph Hearst, some of you might know that name, uh, who lived from 1863 to 1951, was one of the wealthiest and most influential people of his time. 
It was reported that he was worth at that time five, over $500 million. And you just put, um, well, really put inflation on that, see what that's worth today, okay? So all that money. He had an enormous castle that he built in California. Um, the record says 90,000 square feet. It took 28 years to build. How about that? Now, it was said, though, with all of his wealth, all of his influence, he had a terrible fear of death. His fear of death was so bad that uh, those who worked at his estate, if one of the plum trees or other trees started to die, they would quickly, and you might know the story, paint the leaves green until he was out of town and they could just replace the tree altogether. And you were forbidden to use the word death in his presence. On August 14th, 1951, he died. My friends, you don't have to live in fear. Trust these statements from the cross. Christ died for my sins and for your sins. And the promises of God are true. You just need Jesus. Trust in the power of the cross and in the power of the resurrection. You can be, why could we have this statement of fearlessness? Why could we look death in the face? Because death is going to come no matter what. Why can we be fearless? Because on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And one day, because of the grace and the power of God, we will not remain dead. We will be with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. God wants you to know without a shadow of a doubt tonight that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Put your faith in him alone. These seven statements. Oh, how beautiful is that number seven in the Bible, but none more beautiful than here. The statement of forgiveness, the statement of promise, the statement of awareness, the statement of substitution, the statement of scripture, the statement of assurance, and the statement of fearlessness. Because Christ defeated sin on the cross and he defeated death on the third day. If you believe that, say amen. amen.